this broadcast on live stream. Good, good evening, all. Uh, so, uh, looking at some British Championship games this evening for about an hour, part of the Kings Crusher radio show, which has been rescheduled for today. Um, it was rescheduled because I'm representing the UK on 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 another site, and uh, sorry about that. But next next week will be Tuesday uh, at the normal time. So let's look at some British Championship games. Um, but before uh, I do, um, I would just like to say that. Um, well, first of all, can I just confirm uh, that the the audio um, is okay um, for the people at Chessbase? On the chess base server. Whoops. Uh, audio, audio is okay. Cool. So, um, right, right. Okay. So um, there are some chess tips I put on YouTube, which I think are really important, by the way. Probably more important than any single game I'm ever going to go over, right? You know, if I did if I did this for years and years, these five tips would still be important. So I hope you've all seen uh, this video on YouTube. Uh, I'll give you the link if you haven't. Um, <clears throat> so here is my, my video on YouTube, which has five important uh, tips so I hope you can check out uh, that video uh, I'll just paste that in uh, here as well okay so um, okay but let's look at some British Championship games now so the first one is, is an amazing game played today now Susan Lalich was having a brilliant tournament up until round three she had just defeated two grandmasters in a row uh, believe it or not. Yesterday she defeated Mark Hebden and in the first round um, who did she beat? Simon Williams. Um, so that was amazing in fact uh, we, maybe we should try and look at quite a few of these games. I'm going to pick this evening kind of short and, and quite interesting um, games that I found quite attractive from different angles. Uh, now this this first game I found quite attractive uh, because it's the Tarish defence okay and I've stayed away from the Tarish defence myself. It hasn't been my weapon of choice uh, much at all. Every time I try and play the Tarish, actually, I tend to lose quite badly. I don't know about you guys, but it hasn't been a very reliable opening for me. And, um, you know, often I, th I think really uh, what does the Tarish in is the kind of Rubenstein variation, which is basically to Fincetto this bishop. Because when White Fincetto's uh, the bishop, you know, a lot of the dynamism is taken out of Black's game, I think, in the Tarish defence. And Black often ends up with, you know, a weak, isolated Queen's pawn without too much counterplay. That's not the only off putting thing about the opening. If you remember the first Karpov Kasparov match, Kasparov abandoned the Tarash and he created like the Groomfield in exchange for the Tarash and had much better results against Karpov. But that's not a reason for everyone to be put off the Tarash because Karpov was a master at crushing, you know, counterplay, dynamic counterplay. So, uh, you know, I thought there was going to be some merit in, in, in Susan playing it today, but she didn't seem to get a very dynamic position, as we're about to see. So c5, bishop g2, and now knight c6, and now uh, we end up this situation, black's playing that d5, you know, central thrust, and we have c, d, e, d, and the scene is going to be set for that dreaded isolated queen's pawn. Um, so, you know, Karpov was the master against isolated queen's pawns against Kasparov, as I say, in that first Karpov-Kasparov match, classic, uh, when Kasparov came like the youngest world champion. But, um, you know, in that first encounter with Karpov, you know, Karpov was winning these, these, these Tarash games. Uh, so what is White's strategy basically um, in the Tarash? In, in this position, we have this isolated queen's pawn, and we have potentially, you know, these weak dark squares to try and exploit. So we want to blockade, you know, on d4 sometimes, and restrict black's counterplay. Okay. So c5 and e5 are actually quite key squares, yeah? So, so this next move looks a bit odd, actually. Knight a4. Whoops. Sorry, DC, knight a4. So it's immediately on that c5 uh, square. 
So the bishop moves, and now bishop e3. And you look at the strengthening of the dark squares going on here. Really, white wants to try and stranglehold the dark squares and blockade the isolated queen's pawn. Okay. So, now uh, knight e4 was played by Susan. And this supports the idea that, you know, maybe bishop f6, and there's a bit of pressure on white's position. Or maybe rook e8 later. Okay. So rook c1, and actually rook e8 was played here. And then we have this classic blockade of the isolated queen's board. So knight d4. So where does black try and get the counterplay from? Susan now plays bishop d7. So black's not too concerned about either capture. White doesn't want to do that in principle, weaken his, his king. Or take on c6. He plays actually just a retreat back, knight c3. So d5 is immediately like under fire. Now, Susan plays actually knight takes d4. And after bishop takes d4, just humbly protects d5. And it looks a bit passive for this bishop actually. This bishop, um, you know, sometimes in the tarot it's on g4. Putting a bit of pressure, coordinating the rook on the e5. But here, it seems that bishop is a little bit passive. Okay. Um... By the way, I'm just going to adjust the board a bit for, okay. Um, so what does white do here? Gordon um, plays e3, Stephen Gordon, e3. So he's reinforcing his blockade of the d4 square. Now after a6, which is an unusual move. Maybe you know Black should have considered Bishop F6 or Bishop F8. So this this move A6. Uh, there was some speculation in in the live stream today uh, by Andrew Martin. You know it's a bit of bit of a move which like further weakens in effect Black's position. But I suspect the idea of it was you know potentially to be able to play Rook C8 or or move the Rook in principle without allowing simply Bishop takes A7. So the pawn's taken out of the firing line this bishop on d4. The problem is this bishop is also attacking g7. So it's a very nice central position for that bishop. Classic blockade position, reinforced by e3. Why not worrying about the slight weakening of the light squares playing e3? Because d4 is being heavily kind of reinforced here. And now, you know, the bishop is further emphasized with this next move, queen g4. So white hits on e4 and g7, threatening mate in one. So black defends against that mate in one, uh, choosing actually bishop f8. Now you might think bishop f6 is also possible, uh, possibly, um, unless unless knight takes e4 and bishop f6, it could be a little bit more dangerous. But bishop f8 was chosen, and now rook fd1. And it seems you know white still in a really uh, you know comfortable position here. Uh, look at the rooks. You know the the, the the bishops. It's all very very nice and natural looking, and the knight and, and the queen's kind of on the attack as well. It doesn't seem that bad actually on g4. So um, here, black played queen e7. So how does white improve his position? Okay, whilst the knight is doing a seemingly good job, you know, attacking key central squares. Uh, the king's also a useful target. So if the knight can also, say, come to f4, it might be threatening, menacing things against the king. Uh, you can imagine a knight on h5 would be quite a menace, as well as d5. So actually this next move temporarily uh, releases some pressure on the centre to, to re-establish it now, with a slight difference that the knight also has flexibility to help attack the black king and coordinate some pressure on that sensitive g7 square. So this knight rerouting to f4 is kind of interesting. But now, actually, Susan starts to fatally weaken um, her position now. It becomes severely compromised, I believe. And this is the start of it. Because first here, um, she plays the move g6. Now, g6 in principle is weakening these dark squares. But in practice, you might not think, uh, you know, this is that... Um, exploitable okay well 
Well, there's an undermining target, namely this G6 pawn. With this G6 pawn, White now has this undermining operation to try and weaken G6, and he uses it. He plays H4. So how does Black now defend this position? This menacing threat is now H5, takes, and then Knight takes G6. You know, because it takes Queen G6 is actually crushing, because there'll be no defense of, of the king here. Would, would you agree? Do you, do you all see that? That this h4, h5 is a very serious tactical threat. All agree? Everyone still awake? This is the first game of a few I want to go through. So do you all agree that h4, h5 is really dangerous? So this is Gordon versus Lalic today, British Championship. 2011 um, okay um, okay so h5 was played the move h5 which would seem um, an adequate defensive idea if black has something cunning behind it uh, so maybe Susan is thinking the knight cannot possibly take on h5 i think that was black's fault because bishop d7 would kick the queen and then you just take the knight so surely surely knight takes h5 is an impossible move to play here it's refuted it's like setting a tactical trap because you know knight takes h5 is not actually threatening knight f6 because we've got a knight on e4 so that's also reinforcing the idea that knight takes h5 is impossible it's not possible surely surely knight takes h5 is not possible but this is what stephen gordon played he played knight takes h5 wow so has he fallen into a major trap here bishop d7 so is he losing a piece no because look we can use a positional sacrifice now to emphasize these dark squares and it just happens to be a positional sacrifice involving a queen sack so can you all guys spot uh, the queen sack if i give you 10 seconds starting from now yeah so i'll give you 10 seconds starting from now okay tell me what white played here or maybe 20 seconds Someone says queen takes bishop. No, no, that is you got the right idea. You want to emphasize f6, that's a clue. But how would you emphasize f6 with, with a positional sacrifice? Oh, how do I turn notation off? Oh, sorry, you can see it in the notation anyway. All right, sorry about that. I keep forgetting you can see that you can see the moves in the notation all right so we'll get we'll get to the uh, the point that uh, actually okay there's no trap that's been fallen into okay Queen Queen takes e4 um, if I click on opening book do you do you guys still see the notation on chess base do you still see the notation it doesn't affect your notation does it that I've clicked opening book Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. All right, so queen takes e4. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Yeah. What it does, sorry, sorry, you can't see the notation now. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the people on live stream, they can't see the notation, so it's better these quizzes for them. So when you say yes, do you mean you can see the notation or you can't? Oh, you have to turn it off yourselves. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Okay. 
All right, anyway, okay, so um, amazing. So temporary queen sack, so D takes E4, and then we have uh, check, and it's at least, you know, regaining the queen minimum. Yeah. Okay, yeah, t turn off your notation just because we've got some other short games after this. So turn off your notation, yeah, after this, or just move it to the openings book tab so you can go back to it. You know, you can just click openings book maybe on your interface. But anyway, right. Um. So King G7, and now White was regaining material with this discovered check. And look at the celebration of the, of the dark squares, you see, uh, you know, f6 in particular so queen e5 offering the queen back immediately now what what choices were there if, if king h7 well why why can just regain the material now with knight takes um e7 in any case so black you know gives up the queen voluntarily like that takes and now knight b6, nasty pin. Look at that nasty d file, horrible. And then the rook's also coming to the seventh. That's pretty nasty, isn't it? Nasty position. So rook e7, passive defense. Now rook d4. Just, just going to forcibly win material. Now if f5 here, I guess that's a total disaster, f5. Because we're looking at rook c7. And now, uh, you know, there's there's nastiness all sorts of places. How will black defend that? Be very difficult. Um, should we try something? Bishop c6. Bishop c6. Maybe rook, rook takes c6. So if rook takes d4, we've got as weak as I check. That might be good. Uh, but I'm not sure, actually. I'm not sure what the critical... I should have checked this. What would be the critical crunch move if bishop c6? Can anyone help me out here? Because if you play rook takes d8, then there's uh, rook takes c7, isn't there? So what, what is the crispest um, positional crunch move? Actually, after f5... Forget rook c7 because of bishop c6. Actually, as pointed out by Harry Flashman, thank you very much. Rook c6, rook c7 would be tempting, but actually a blunder, right? As we can see, there wouldn't be much in rook c7. Simply, a rook d4 also did support the doubling of the rooks, the classic battery. So actually, rook cd1 is much more painful for black. So you've got three pieces coordinating on d7 with a double battery on, of the rooks. And this bishop cannot move now because of the rook on d8. And d7 cannot actually be defended. So thank you. Uh, 50 points to Flashman. Thank you very much. Well done. Okay. Um, okay. So rook cd1 would be the crushing end of game, end of story. Um, if rook e6, uh, then, you know, either rook d7 or knight d7, it's, it's dead easy. Okay. So uh, let's have a quick review of this game and we'll move on to another game. So um, the Tarash defense, I found quite a depressing opening to play. And this game really didn't change my verdict of the Tarash. I don't know if any of you play it with great success, but I think, um, you know, it's a difficult opening to play uh, when you get this position against the Rubenstein variation in particular, you know, with the, the Fincetto. Right. So um, there's, you know, a very st strong dark square blockade going on here. And clever stuff from white. Where actually E3, if we look in retrospect to E3, not only did it support this blockade point D4, it also meant the knight could reroute via E2 to F4, where it not only has contact with a central point, but also potentially black's king side. So if we look at E3, uh, it seems to be fully justified by the result of this game. It played a pivotal role for the knight maneuver, uh, leading to this decisive combinatory uh, conclusion. So the knight rerouted to, to f4, and you know all of white's pieces very neat and harmonious here. Um, and black provides this, you know, fatal weakening move. Okay, 
uh, which as though black was setting a trap, but really uh, black fell into a trap. So knight takes h5, bishop d7, ha ha, you fall into a trap, not really, queen takes e4. So queen takes e4 is really horrible um, for black here in this particular position. So uh, check, winning back the queen with massive advantage, uh, forcing the rook to defend d7, and now rook d4, and black can't get out of it. You know, he's faced... She's faced with rook cd1, and there's nothing to do here. Uh, it's not just a pawn. There's nothing to do about losing a piece. It's a really painful position. So that, that's it. You know, it's it's it. You know, black didn't have a chance in this game. Waste of a day. Whole day gone. Depressing game. On the bright side, she's beaten two GMs in the previous two rounds. So I'm sure she's still having a whale of the time. Whatever happens from now on, she's beaten two GMs in the first two rounds, and she's less than 2300, so that's fine. She's gained loads of FIDE rating points anyway. St you know, Stephen Gordon was expected to win this game. But let's go on to uh, some other games, okay? So, Summer Scale Shorts was a bit of a short game. <laughs> part of the pun. Sorry, that's 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 not very original, is it? This is a bit of a short game and we're going to we're going to see from 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 Nigel Short's um point of view this game, okay? So d4 and Nigel Short plays a sort of nasty little trick in the opening in this game where it it was almost going to be like a, a Nimzo Indian um, defense, uh, but it had this horrible, evil transposition into a snake Benoni accelerated, believe it or not. Okay, so I'm sure some of you don't even know what am I talking about, snake Benoni. A snake Benoni is a Benoni without weakening, actually these squares, without weakening these squares as we've just seen. If you don't want to fin chess or your bishop, your bishop goes to d6 in the snake Benoni and comes out like a snake, slivering to a5. Okay, so that's what Short did by transposition here, having all the Benoni trump cards that you get from the modern Benoni. Right, trust me on this. So we're talking semi-open e-file pressure, queenside pawn majority, but with, with no weaknesses on the king side. So, okay, knight f6, that's the background to this game. So knight f6, so c4, and now e6, looks like a normal Nimzo Indian. Everyone recognizes this position as normal Nimzo Indian territory, surely. Okay, so knight c3, bishop b4. Now the first surprise, Nigel Short says he was surprised by this move. Now Kasparov's favorite move in this position is queen c2. Another good move is e3. But this next move is more unusual, I think, on the list. This, by the way, is Rubenstein's innovation again. You know, Rubenstein had a lot of innovations all over the place. And I think e3 is the Rubenstein system. But queen c2, I think, overtook the general popularity as being the most popular move, queen c2. But this next this move is interesting as well, bishop g5. But does it lead into this evil transposition? That I've just mentioned because black now creates the Bononi structure he plays c5 which is tempting the modern Bononi pawn structure if you look at this if white's playing d5 we're getting a modern Bononi pawn structure because we're going to have a weak pawn on d6 yeah white would seem to have classic maneuvers available but that's not really the case to exploit d6 okay so we're talking about uh, a system transposition from the Nimzo Indian to a kind of different sort of Benoni where black has not touched the kingside pawns. So d5 and now d6. Look at this. Benoni without the Fianchetto. You know, this bishop is usually here in the Benoni. No, the bishop is on b4. Think about that. The bishop is on b4. What advantages do we have? We have less weaknesses on the king side. Okay. Knight f3. And now look, we're going further into Benoni transposition, snake Benoni transposition. Because e takes d5, c takes d5. 
So c takes d5 gives the c4 square for the classic manoeuvre against the Benoni, correct? But this bishop, it's as though, you know, the snake Benoni has been played in an accelerated fashion. So black, as in the Benoni, has the semi-open e-file pressure and also the potential for a6 and b5. Those are the trump cards of the Benoni. And it seems without the downside of the weakening of the king side. So knight's bd7. And now white does play this Benoni manoeuvre as if he's playing against modern Benoni. Knight d2. Okay. So the knight's heads, you know, for c4 to probe d6. That would be really appropriate if it was the modern Benoni, but it's actually not quite the modern Benoni, this position. So Nigel Shaw actually makes it a little difficult actually for White to ever play e4. He plays the move queen e7. And now if White wants to play e4, it's going to come at a cost. You know, h6 would grab in effect the dark square bishop because if the bishop moved back and then g5, then knight takes e4 because we've got a pin on c3 here. So e4 is ruled out unless white wants to give up the, the dark square bishop. e4 is ruled out here. So we've got an inferior modern baloney where white is not able to play e4. Okay. So Aaron, who's 2415 at the moment, uh, to shorts 2687, he plays actually queen c2. Uh, probably thinking, well, you know, he can prepare e4, surely he can prepare it. Well, black just castles now. And white does something incredibly risky, actually. He's he's not content, maybe, with his position. Maybe, maybe, you know, Aaron could have potentially played e3, bishop e2, and castle kingside. May, you know, maybe. That's an idea. Um, but he castles queenside and it's usually very very dangerous to castle queenside you've got a lot of protected you know weaknesses to protect you know a lot of pawns a lot of weaknesses it's usually very very dangerous to castle queenside okay and the thing is black still has this potential now as in the Benoni for playing a6 and b5 with the white king as a target on the queenside so a6 was played here. Okay. So e4 and now b5. Often in a normal Benoni, white would have played a4, would have had the king over here, and you know would have clamped down on these dark squares and looked forward to probing d6. But these are distant dreams. Black's got the trump card of the semi-open e-file pressure, has got the expanding queenside pawn majority it's got all the trump cards with bonus points that the white king is on the queen side not only that black has no weakness with you know the bishop being here there's no weaknesses on the king side okay so f3 and now c4 c4 provides c5 so we've got knight c5 on the cards as well you know, bishop b7, you know, rook c8, knight d3 would be quite painful. So we've got this, this king on c1. So bishop e2 is played. But actually not knight c5. The knight is actually on duty guarding this, this guy and can come to e5 as appropriate. So actually, knight actually plays bishop c5. So he's unblocked his pawn. It's ready to go for, you know, maybe like this. So knight f1, and actually the knight comes to b6 now, as though b4, you know, without knight a4, you know, maybe bishop d7 to stop knight a4, and then b3, you know, that would be seemingly quite crushing. So the knight retreats, bishop d7. What can white do? He's just, you know, these pawns are really dangerous. Look at all these pieces controlling all these squares on the king side, not that one, uh, but all these other squares, okay, are getting controlled so as I say do you agree now that it's like a Benoni without any of the downsides 
but with bonus points that the white king is on c1 not over here <clears throat> so queen uh, c3 is played which you know seemingly provokes actually b4 but you know probably maybe he's thinking the c4 pawn might be weak b4 anyway okay the c4 pawn slightly weak queen e1 as though hang on hang on queen h4 bit of pressure on f6 something to look forward to h6 asking the bishop where it wants to go it goes here and now nigel starts tearing into the black king side he plays actually c3 which is neat yeah because maybe white was looking forward to bishop takes d takes to have these pawns in the center but no there's something very rude about this if bishop takes c5 then black could play takes as nigel short explained and then check king moves then knight takes c5 leaving this pawn to restrain these pawns no pawn mo mobility for white in the center in this game so aaron doesn't want that variation no he doesn't want that variation um he can't take on c5 here he plays actually bish b takes c3 now the king's really getting sliced rook fc8 the, the heavy artillery is coming in these rooks are disconnected by that knight at the moment c4 and now a sharp move which really emphasizes the c file from nigel bishop b5 putting pressure on that poor c4 point white's collapsing here look at these knights on the first rank look at this disconnection of the rooks white's attack hasn't started at all look at black's king just laughing here without any pressure there's no pressure around the black king all the pressure is around the white king this is the sort of game you want you want to spend the whole day torturing the opponent without any risk yeah the opponent's king's totally at risk on the c file and your kings are safe as houses here so bishop takes c5 rook takes c5 look c4 is collapsing how can how can white defend c4 it's horrendous by the way um you, you can see live streams each day at 2 15 london time i'm just going to give you the link just in case you're not aware on livestream.com slash leyland chess so 2 15 onwards london time check it out tomorrow uh every you know there's nine rounds to go of the british it's 11 rounds but today's commentary and yesterday's were brilliant uh today was a bit of a slow start but other than that you know yesterday especially was brilliant today was also brilliant once it got started and you know nigel short was demonstrating his own game i'm just telling you some of the ideas that he was demonstrating that he thought you know it was just easy to play and it looks easy to play and you know it it, it doesn't last very long from here so knight e3 so c4 is collapsing bishop takes c4 so bishop takes c4 knight takes c4 a lot of exchanges and the, the defense is being stripped bare isn't it really the defense is being stripped bare so king d2 now the rooks double and you know once the rooks double there's lots more of opportunities like rook c2 you know maybe knight d5 at the appropriate moment when the king's trying to cross over there scrambling for safety so king e2 um okay the rook though holds on to d5 so actually a, a different move is chosen knight takes e4 uh because you know if takes then rook takes e4 check is winning the queen so king f1 it's it's terrible isn't it queen f6 it's total disaster so what does queen f6 do in particular though well actually um aaron resigns here um so why did Aaron resign here it does look dire because look at the rooks that they're, they're, they're not connected they're, they're very long way from being uh, connected ever um but um what concrete thing uh may black uh consider doing next um 
Knight Knight C3 looks looks tempting. You know, just just to get a, a very dangerous C pawn. That's one idea. But and um, probably there's other ideas. Um, it looks hopeless. Does anyone have any concrete winning plan from here apart from Knight C3? Um, may, maybe actually Rook C2 looks kind of tasty. To go to F2 check, that looks quite tasty as well. Or, or simply take on A2 and then double the Rooks, you know, on, on that second rank. So it all looks pretty miserable because any time the Rook moves, there's Rook C1, you know, skewering uh, the Queen. So probably, probably. Uh, Rook c2, queen e4 though might be an issue um, unless queen b2 there is winning. Uh, but it looks totally hopeless. Okay. Um, should we give it a token example? All right. Uh, without moving, it's, it's difficult to move anything. But let's say queen e3 for argument's sake. Let's just say queen e3. So as I say, knight c3 looks tempting. Um, pro probably, actually, Queen B two is suggested on live stream. Queen B two, Queen B two. Yeah. What about also Queen H four? Look at this threatening Knight G three check. And if takes, there's still rookie f four. No, actually, that's not that's not so clear. Okay, who's got a killer move? Here against against Queen E3. Come on, we've got a brilliant position here. Who's got the killer move? Oh, oh, sorry, Susan. Susan, um, uh, it's gone now. Yes, I do YouTube videos on on King's YouTube Com King's Crusher. Um, oh, or maybe just Knight C3 winning a pawn. That's that's the suggestion. That's another suggestion. Knight C3. Um, that looks pretty dire, actually. I, I think that's enough. It's just positionally lost. There may, there may not be a, a force mate. It's queen Queen B two, cool gut says yeah. Um, quick Queen B two. Okay, Queen Queen B two. What about this uh, takes here? What do you play here? I think the safest is just knight c3. Rook c1. That does indeed, indeed look dangerous because you're immediately threatening all sorts of nasty things. That that looks pretty crushing actually. As, as it goes, that does look quite crushing. Uh, the king can't escape and there's immediate threat of rook takes d1. And if rook e1... Then you can just at least you can win the queen if nothing else. Okay, good, good, good stuff. So let's go through that game again then, just briefly in overview and summary. So it was an evil transposition from the Nimzo engine defense to some kind of accelerated snake Pannoni. So black has all the trump cards in the position, with white really this plan is not that effectual here against d6 it's not that effectual Nigel Short has tricked poor Aaron into some terrible terrible depressing position so um, Queen e7 and black has that advance on the Queen side and a really crushing you know attack brewing up against the king now after c3 it's really slaughter time for the white king it's really horrible it's crushing the rooks double it's made to look easy this game but really it's amazing what must be under the surface the variations um so queen f6 and, and resigns okay so that's a good idea this queen b2 and rook c1 very nice so if queen e3 was saying uh, queen b2, very nice. Okay, so let's look at another game. Okay. Um, so Adams had uh, a quick win today. 
Whoops, not that one. This one. So let's look at Adams's um, win. Okay. So e4. From Adams, let's flip the board. C5, Sicilian defence. And we have uh, the old kind of fischer sozin kind of attack with this early like bishop c4, which Adam says he hasn't played much uh, recently. Um, and he talks about not being that effectual with it. But uh, this was seemingly very effectual, this game, um, because black went wrong at a critical moment. Uh, so preempting b5 for black, bishop b3. B5 anyway, now white castles. Not worrying about E4, by the way. So it's offered as a kind of, you know, gambit. It's, it's going to be too many issues for black to eat the E4 pawn. It's a hot pawn as, as, as um, hot pawn, as, 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 as Andrew Martin has said, for poison pawns. Um, that sounds a bit naughty. Sorry, I shouldn't use that term. Hot button. Okay, forget that term. Just poison pawn. I think we'll stick with poison pawn. So bishop e7, um, queen f3, and you know there might be you know e5 and and, and queen takes a8. Uh, you know uh, so, but black you know has this resourceful move queen b6 because now if e5 there's bishop b7 just in time you know protecting the rook and attacking the queen. So e5 is not a big. Um, problem at all so bishop e3 uh now there's horrible discovered you know a queen a, a, you know a, a, on the queen so the queen has to move and it goes to, actually to b7 shielding that diagonal as, as well from e5 from the queen's glare on the, the rook on a8 okay so queen g3 is a nifty parking place for the queen because it's eyeing that g7 it's eyeing d6 it means bishop h6 is nasty later sometimes forcing uh, you know a, a measly knight retreat in some variations just to defend against a mate on g7 so b4 was played now not with the idea of actually winning this pawn because you know white's threatening queen g7 just just dislodging the knights for a moment now f3 and now black castles and how, here is the funny thing about this game. Adams has played all this before against someone, and he's even done in-depth engine analysis of some of the variations from here. And he doesn't mind playing his next move, what he played, uh, not fearing uh, a response in the centre from black. He plays this move anyway. He plays a3. He's not fearing taking and then d5. He's researched this position. It's not just spur of the moment made up. So takes and rook takes a3. So intuitively you might think, oh, awkward rook, and is d5 possible? It's, it's not really a big deal to sacrifice the exchange actually uh, with taking and then bishop h6. So you'd win it back. You'd win the exchange back in a lot of variations. So d5 wasn't chosen. In fact, knight c5 was chosen. So Adams calmly retreats his knight so as if knight takes c5 forcing d takes is, is, is on the cards but also you know maybe you know the knight could, could go to f4 but also bishop d4 might be possible so the knight takes on a4 and bishop takes off a4 offering b2 now adam's intuition didn't let him down here i don't know if he was joking as if he didn't really seriously consider uh, queen takes b2. But the brief engine analysis I did is that this is bad for black to take on b2. Adams did mention about knight d4 to c6. You know, after rook b3, taking knight d4, then to c6. Because that kind of embarrasses e7. Which might mean f6 and, and this one is going to be more effective against g7. So this might be a poison pawn. Okay, I'm going to say poison pawn. Yeah. This b2 pawn. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, so bishop d7. Avoiding that poison pawn. 
but it means white can play this attacking move now rook b3 kicking the queen and then also slightly weakening now the light squares bishop takes d7 getting rid of this otherwise awkward bishop on the edge of the board has just been exchanged off and now white can get along with bishop h6 driving the knight back just to defend against this mate threat so it's starting to look like a miserable passive position for black but you know black should have worked you know very hard if he wants to win or draw against adams uh to find the necessary resources needed to survive this position he is a very strong grandmaster danny gormani often nicknamed the gormalizer he has torn apart many many gms in his time and it's a shame that he doesn't last too many moves from this position because of a bad blunder the gormalizer is gormalized so knight e8 and you know as i say one of the perks of the queen on g3 is not just to i g7 but also i d6 and adams's next move exerts more pressure on that d6 pawn he plays actually rook d1 so uh there is more pressure because also remember we've got this e5 at any point to put even more pressure we'd have this one this one this one all on d6 okay starting to get a bit unpleasant for black rook c8 good move in principle c4 active rook but also you know remember we've got pivot squares along the c file which might be useful yeah these pivot squares bear those in mind uh because i've seen a variation with an engine earlier on this game where black could have been very very resourceful okay adams for the moment defends his c2 pawn he plays rook d2 now gormani evicts the bishop in effect he's now threatening g takes h so the bishop moves to g5 and it's here that really even though the position looks a bit depressing and as flat as a pancake defensive gormani should have tried really hard here uh to discover it easier said than done to discover that actually bishop takes g5 wouldn't have been that bad because queen takes and he can live another day because knight f6 e5 it is not really to be feared there's either check or there's rook c5 which is a resource i found to pin that pawn against the queen and this might be okay uh for for black it might actually be okay this position um black might even consider rook d5 later to shield you know this d file but no no he goes disastrously wrong he goes totally wrong um in this position he didn't play bishop takes g5 no he played this it's it's not a good move knight f6 whoops knight f6 after bishop g5 he plays knight f6 it's terrible Look at white wants what wants to do, you know, with this one, this one, this one. Of course, white wants to play e5, and it will be horrendous now, totally, because knight d5. What have we got here? We've got, you know, bishop takes, and winning this pawn. It's it's starting to be really nasty. Just winning that pawn, yeah. That that's just terrible. Uh, queen moves, say. To f4 and it's, it's really bad it's too important to lose so um Gormali, um just in effect resigns <laughs> it's it's ridiculous but that's what happens he in effect resigns with this move check because after bishop e3 he's just losing a piece off to the pub oh dear oh dear oh dear i think waste of a whole day i'm sorry but i you know if i was at this level i'd want to work, work really hard to find the resources of the position yeah for black and not play a casual move i think you know bishop takes g5 needed the thorough investigation you can't just sound positional principles oh you don't want to give up the dark square bishop because you're weakening the dark squares it needs to be investigated bishop g5 
I don't know what you guys think. In this position as black, would would you be completely depressed already, or would you try and investigate Bishop takes G five? You know, because this rook's got pivot points. You know, God's sake, why not use these pivot points? Or bear them in mind. You know, rooks. It's easy to say with engine analysis. I'm, I'm really biased. It's easy to be an armchair grandmaster nowadays because everyone's got you know Houdini or whatever, and you say, oh, what rubbish moves they played. But you know, in the actual tournament hole, you know, they're probably terrified playing opponents you know 200 points higher than them. You know, under a lot of pressure, probably didn't sleep very well the night before. There's a lot of psychological pressure. Everyone's taking the mickey on the internet with all their engines so it's probably really hard to play now uh, especially against you know the super gms but it's funny that the super gms are also seemingly very calm you know short and adams they're not desperate to win very quickly they're playing very accurate moves you know they're keeping calm and they're mopping up these guys these these guys are in a class below these other gms you know, Adams and Short, they're 2600, 2700. They've, they've both been in the 2700s. But, you know, Gourmali is a really good GM. You know, it's just a shame. I just think it's a bit of a shame. Um, I don't know. Maybe he had something in mind why Bishop G5 wasn't that attractive. It seems, you know, this this forcing this knight manoeuvre is quite a big deal, actually. I've seen that in other Adams games. It's quite a big deal, it seems, to carry out this primitive threat of bishop h6 to provoke knight e8. It obviously is quite a big deal, because it's not just about the g7 weakness. It's about the d6 weakness and about this d file. So let's have a quick look at this game again in overview and summary. So this obviously is quite a dangerous system with this sneaky, you know, queen coming to g3 later. Okay. So the early bishop c4. So we've got a sneak, not, not via e1, sorry, not via e1, via f3. That's the sneakiness, by f3. So we've got this key square to bear in mind, this g3 square. And we have a disaster in the making pretty soon. Sorry, Leeches, why not C6? C C6 where? Sorry, I, I don't know. If you, if you don't give me a move number, it's really difficult to see what, what you mean. But let's just review the game, just to reinforce the concept of the game. That having a queen on G3 is really dangerous, right? And this bishop H6, whoops. This bishop H6 is really dangerous as well, as an idea. So bishop d7, so white's got rid of the problem piece, that bishop on a4, and black gets a passive position, there's a lot of pressure on black here, but the pressure just results in an immediate victory unfortunately, because of one key blunder from black, this casual move knight f6. Bang, e5, end of game. I mean, he could have just lost the d6 pawn. It's a bit miserable after knight d5. But he's not losing a piece, you know, after knight d5. Is he? It's not a whole piece, is it? So this is the way of just, just resigning, just check. Okay, let's have a look at another short game. I quite kind of like these short instructive games. Um, I think they're quite good fun. But actually, in, um, so I did start late. So should we have one more? Or do you want to carry on next week? Um, there's not too many of you here. I, I know I'm a bit late tonight as well. Do you want to go over one more game? Or has everyone had enough? Everyone had enough? One more quickly. Okay, there's some demand on live stream for one more. Um, with five viewers on those. Okay, we'll do one more. Just just for my own interest. Okay. Um, 
Hebden against Rudd was an elegant game. Let's have a look at that. Okay. <clears throat> so Hebden against Rudd was an attractive game from round one, which I was going to do a YouTube video anyway for, so I'm going to do it. Let's have a look at this Hebden Rudd. You see, Mark Hebden, right, um, there's an analogy here. There's this famous chef. We've got this weird chef in the UK which does this delicious looking food which looks sometimes really evil or scary which is actually you know delicious and it's not as scary as, as first seemed and Hebden's play is it's almost pretend stereotypical as if you could have banged out all of Hebden's moves in a one minute game because they look so natural yeah if you look at his games it's strange it's like pretend stereotypical chess it's 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 amazing uh, but actually, you know, at the critical moments, he's playing super precise moves. So although it seems to be a stereotypical game, you know, it was also a very accurate game at the same time. So it's kind of illusionary, this game. So he's playing a low rated IM, Jack Rudd, who has up and down results. And he plays the dreaded Torre attack system. Okay. So D4. Knight f6, knight f3, e6, and the dreaded Tory attack system is this horrible like pawn triangle later with usually the bishop on g5. So c3, b6, and the bishop comes to g5, bishop b2, knight d2, and these are all moves you could play quite quickly you would imagine to get to this setup here you could bang these moves out without learning much theory because the bishop's basically outside of the pawn chain and you've got this solid pawn triangle in the center now tell me you all agree this is quite simple so far you could all play this in a one minute game please tell me this is quite simple for white so far yeah would you agree there's nothing doesn't seem at all complex about this game so far so what is White's next stereotypical plan? Well, stick the rooks in the center, right? And play, you know, for E4, E5, right? That's the next stereotypical plan. So have a look at this. Castles, Bishop D3, D6. Now Queen E2, as though E4, E5 is going to happen. A6, E4. Now put the rooks together. Castle. Put one rook on d1 and put the other rook on e1. So far, so good. Move 12. Look at white's position. Very nice. Bishop, nice. e5 threatened. Nice. Nice pawn chain. No major pawn structural weaknesses. Rooks connected. Does everyone think they can play this in a one minute game? I've convinced you at move 12. You can still play this in a one minute game. Is that correct? Or is it my imagination? Because this happens a lot when I look at Hebden games. I'm thinking that they're easy. But actually, um, you know, he's got precision at the critical moments. But so far, it looks very, very simple stuff. So stereotypical plan three. Okay, I've told you the first one and the second one preparing for e4. The third one will be to dislodge f6 and start an attack on h7 right so knight g6 first bishop b1 okay bishop b1 now black is is annoyed you know with this tension in the center with this this lurking you know e5 threat so he tries to simplify gets some pieces off okay he plays knight g4 some some pieces come off an invitation get rid of the bishops okay the bishops have got rid of and in the process, you know, maybe f4 is a bit weaker. You know, maybe this knight's justified on f4 more. Slight compromise for white, maybe. Okay. h3, kick one of the knights back. Then get your e5 in. So you're starting to weaken the h7 square. Knight d5. Okay. Stereotypical so far. But who now, who, right would give up their lovely, lovely bishop on the diagonal for this measly knight on g6.
But remember, f4 is under fire. You've just given up your dark square bishop. So you've weakened your dark squares, particularly f4. You know, that's Kaspar's favourite knight outpost on the king side, f4, f5. But who would think of this next move? Bishop takes g6. That's not so stereotypical, is it? Bishop takes g6. Would you agree? This is counterintuitive, this move. Would everyone agree? It's slightly counterintuitive. Okay. H takes G. And the queen goes into gear on the king side. Queen E4. So the queen can now come to G4 maybe, or H4 if the queen's not eyeing H4. And then knight G5, and then, you know, queen H7, dangerous. So rook AB8, and the queen parks on G4. Like in the Adams game, you know, the queen on G3 is eyeing D6. And G7, the queen on G4 is eyeing E6, and here G6. Okay, queen, queens there are dangerous. Queen D7. Now knight G5. Simple, simple chess. Look, queen H4, queen H7, dangerous stuff. Emergency for black already. What what on earth is black doing here? Look, look at all these poxy pieces. These, these mean nothing. What, what is this bishop doing here? Where is black strategic breaks? This is going to take ages. It's not going to achieve anything. Also, this knight's ready to come to e4, and then maybe, you know, queen h4, and then knight f6 is, is vulnerable. So black plays a desperate-looking move. Desperate-looking move. F6. He's weakened his king quite considerably with this f6 move. So how does Hebden carry on from here? Okay. He takes on f6. After knight takes f6, beautiful parking manoeuvre, queen h4. Okay. Now if knight h5, there's g4, you know, we can evict this knight and get back to h7 if we want. So queen b5, it's finally a resourceful technical move you'd expect from these one day games that some opponents are going to start playing computer like moves because they've got all this time to research all these little, little resources in the position. So queen b5, is that going to be the critical defense to come to h5 or something? Okay, and it's also hitting b2. So is this the critical move that Hebden might have missed by playing all these seemingly very easy moves? Well, in this position actually, he doesn't have to do anything radical, he just plays b3, protecting the b2 pawn. Okay, but the queen has got f5 available. But really, do you want to go to f5? Do you want to go to d3? I don't know. So there's another technical move played by black. Well, queen d3 is asking for knight e4 anyway. So forget queen d3. Queen f5 is not that attractive, surely, because there's also g4. If white wants to evict the queen unless g4 facely loses loses on the light squares or just maybe rook e3 or even knight e4 okay sorry so okay what was chosen was actually queen a5 so forking two pawns okay technical move hebden is glad to give up the a2 pawn he has also beaten zx spectrums in the 1980s where they used to win the a2 pawn you know, and then used to make them on the king side. So he's also been some computers in the 80s. So he's aware that he can give up the a2 pawn for a vicious attack. Okay. Jack doesn't take the a2 pawn. He plays e5. And in the process, he's blocking, you know, the bishop on the diagonal now because d5 shuts that bishop away. This bishop is, is getting pathetic. Unless it's going to reroute, it's looking a bit sad. Rook e7. Now the other knight comes in. Okay, the rook on e7 is, is of course, indirectly protecting against h7. You know, takes, you know, h7 is protected by that rook. Fine. And now the materialism, queen takes a2. Is it going to be punished? Rook lift. Whoops, pardon me, pardon me. Sorry, queen e2, rook lift, rook e3. Okay, so the rook can come in for the for the attack. Maybe it's f3 or to g3. Rook e3. 
So bishop c8 is played here. So where is white's attack? This move is also, of course, defending b3. So where is white's attack? Well, he plays actually g4. OK. Now bishop d7 is played. And now he goes in for the kill. He plays takes and knight e4. You know, he's on f6. It's very difficult to defend this position with this f6 weakness. So rook f7, but he doesn't take that pawn actually, because maybe king g7 then rook h8, and that's dangerous for these pawns. Instead, he plays queen h6, stopping any king g7 idea. And you know maybe uh, you know rook f3 is still really dangerous. Well, queen g6 is is a major threat. So queen c2. Attacking uh, d1, that's moved actually. So still, he's got that threat on g6 now, and this other one might actually backfire on the queen if if black is not careful here. So rook b f8, and look at this next move. Wow, this next move. Wow, what would most of us play here? Wouldn't most of us take the pawn on g6? Now, maybe this is winning as well, actually. Um, or is it? Is this winning? You see, if rook g7, we've got knight f6, and then we're winning the queen. But maybe, you know, maybe king h8. And then the knight's kind of pinned, you know, to the queen. So actually, you know, Hebden's delicate move, seemingly delicate move here is not queen takes g6. But actually to play rook c3. So he, he drives the queen away from that diagonal first. And he goes back. Now, black didn't try uh, rook queen c2. That, that's interesting. Are, we the, are they just getting up to the time control? He plays actually rook h7. And then we see check. Now, if rook g7, there's knight f6. And if takes, there's queen f6. So king h8. No, knight takes f6. And it's all getting a bit torn apart. You know, threatening mate all over the place. If rook g7, queen h6, mating. So rook h4 was played here. And now we have another mate threat offering the rook now as well. Knight h5 threatens queen g7 mate immediately. Um, Black just gave in here because also his rook's attacked, right? So he can't, you know, he's got to do something about the rook as well. So he plays rook g8, which allows, you know, a mate in one. Queen h6 mate. So I thought that was an interesting game. Um, sort of pretend stereotypical chess as if many of the moves you could bang out in a one minute game. I don't know about you guys, but there was some kind of precision going on at critical positions later. Uh, I think you might agree. If we have a look at that game just briefly again, just an overview and summary. So it's the sort of system we could all play quite quickly. The Tory attack. But with a difference, you know, that um, willingly giving up the bishop for bishop g6. This queen maneuver is fairly nifty. And this final phase of giving up pawn on the queen side for accelerating the attack is very good for the rook lift on the third rank. Um, so it's all pretty neat stuff. And yeah, I mean, there was there was a video, by the way, about how to beat the Torre attack as well on my YouTube channel. So it's interesting, the Torre, the ups and downs of the Torre are being demonstrated in this British Championship, actually. Um, the Torre had a disaster in another round. But anyway, this, this was a success for the Torre in the first round. Okay, so um, it's, it's, I don't know, against um, 
some defenses it's going to be good and against others not so good so um hope you enjoyed this week and i've gone on for probably longer than usual um thanks very much hopefully see you uh, next tuesday at my normal slot time next tuesday at seven london time okay thanks very much see you next tuesday cheers <laughs>